dreams, ghosts, and heroes. In the Greek mind, side by side with the Apollonian dwelt the Dionysiac, along with the harmonious, rational world of plastic form and intellectual clarity, there dwelt among the Greek people the dark, the eerie, and the undisciplined. The Dionysiac conjured up the dead and induced the belief in witches, ghosts, and other apparitions. The nightmares of the Greeks shared the repulsive qualities that later characterized medieval ghosts and devils, not unlike those which exist in our own time, bringing to our dreams hybrids, witches, and grotesque animals. Apuleius describes a harrowing nightmare in his Metamorphoses. After a hearty dinner, Aristomenes and his friend retired to a shabby hostel in Thessalonia. Sleep had scarcely come to Aristomenes when the door opened and two witches entered the room. Aristomenes' bed collapsed, pinning him beneath it. From this uncomfortable position, he saw the two hags stab his friend and afterwards neatly pour his blood into a leather flask. One of them plunged her arm into the wound and drew out the victim's heart, after which she closed the orifice with a sponge while murmuring these magic words. Beware, O sea-born sponge, how thou dost pass through a river. Whereupon the two creatures turned their attentions to the fearful Aristomenes and defiled him. Then they vanished. On the following morning, however, the dream proved to have been real, for when the friend stooped to drink at the river, the wound opened, the magic sponge fell into the water, and with it the corpse of the bewitched traveller. Just as this dream became reality, so among the imaginative Greeks the real merged with the illusory. In their dreams they saw the mythical monsters whose images they had observed during the day, and afterwards they believed that the visit of the magic creature was no hallucination, but it actually happened. But even when the dream was recognized as one, it still furnished enough substance for conjecture. In their dreams, they saw the forerunners of the future, experienced divine revelations, and had premonitions of impending danger. Most of these nightly visitors filled them with terror. Pan the goat-footed, the goat-horned son of the nymph Dyrope, was the reputed sender of nightmares. To the early Christians, the devil appeared as a panic figure and inherited the attributes of the Grecian shepherd god. Seafarers, before sailing, would sleep in the temple of Poseidon, praying to the sea god for a prophetic dream wherein they might glimpse the outcome of their voyage. The temples of Asclepos, too, were famous, where the god of healing would reveal remedies to his believers during sleep. God-sent dreams were not only for the individual. Magistrates and generals were often sent to the temples to dream of official business and to learn the will of the gods. When Alexander the Great lay mortally stricken, several of his generals visited the temples of Asclepos to ask whether the king should be left in his palace or be carried to the sanctuary. Asclepos replied that it was best to leave the dying hero where he was. A remarkable feature of this Asclepian dreaming is that it formed the basis of medical science among the Greeks. After each successful cure, the case history together with the god's prescription was recorded in writing or carved upon the temple walls. As the creature passed, a reliable archive was created of significant therapeutic dreams. The great physician Hippocrates is said to have been indebted for his knowledge largely to the temple records of Kos, his native city. We are reminded at this point of a dream which saved the city of Athens from a plague. The nightly apparition which came to a dreaming woman in the form of a deceased Scythian, who counseled that wine be poured into the streets and alleys of the stricken town. Following the Scythian's advice, the foul air was cleansed by wine, and the pestilence disappeared. The importance of dreams is reflected in the stress placed upon their correct interpretation. Considerable rewards awaited whoever possessed that gift. 
a work that soon became famous as the dream book of Artemidorus Daldanius, Apuleius's contemporary. Many dreams, says Artemidorus, represent a simple and direct image of the event which they foretell. Others show symbols whose meaning must be ascertained. The interpreter should know every detail of the dream which he wishes to explore. If the beginning is confused, he should start his interpretation at the end and reascend to the source. Moreover, he should know the dreamer's state of mind, his social standing, and his state of health. It is important to know whether the dreamer is a master or a slave, a rich man or a pauper, an old man or a youth. They may have similar dreams which should, however, be interpreted in various ways. If an old man dreams about being wounded in the chest, he must expect bad news. If a young girl has a similar dream, she may expect a devoted lover. If a poor man dreams that he has changed into a woman, this is a good sign, for someone will take care of his needs. Yet to the rich, this same dream announces the end of his authority. He will retire from public life into a petty domestic existence. A slave will be pleased to dream of being assisted and comforted, whereas the master's similar dream announces misery and insult. A sick person will die when a dream shows him an innkeeper, for the latter, like death, receives whomsoever, but to the healthy, the innkeeper means travels into many countries. Certain dreams, says Artemidorus, are a good omen to people specialized in a craft or profession. The nightly vision of ants invading one's ears is favorable to educators and professors who will be listened to by the public, symbolized by ants. For other people, this same dream signifies death. Like ants, they will dwell in the earth. He who eats books in a dream will die soon. To lawyers, teachers, and statesmen, however, eating books allegorizes the increase of knowledge. To have donkey ears is a good dream only for philosophers, who will interpret this flattering fashion they will be indifferent to gossip and vain rumors, because the donkey seldom moves its ears. To other people, the donkey dream announces servitude. They will have to toil like domestic animals. To be dressed up ridiculously is an agreeable presage for anyone who dislikes to be ridiculed. For comedians and dancers, such a dream predicts great success on the stage. Dreams of horror, which Artemidorus enumerates carefully, may well signify good luck. To hold one's head in one's hand is only favorable for him who has neither wife nor children. However, to be burned at the stake is a good omen for all. The sick, when dreaming of such execution, will readily recover, and young people will know the passions of love. Whipping is also a good omen. To be fustigated by a wealthy and capable person prevents favorable and profitable things. Similarly favorable is the dream of crucifixion. Whoever sees himself crucified will enjoy a fairly serene married life. To seafarers, it indicates a good voyage, because the cross, like the ship, is made of wood and nails, and because the misery of the crucified is not unlike seasickness. To a politician, crucifixion announces an office. He will be raised at the very place where the cross was elevated in the dream. For slaves, the same dream signifies that they will soon be free men. The cult of the dead among the Greeks at this time was also widespread. Often the deceased would return from their graves, having neglected to complete some act during their lifetime, or because an important part of the mortuary rites had been omitted. Usually they spread terror throughout the house, and we rarely find in these apparitions the tenderness and poetry of that which came to Eucrates' dwelling. Eucrates had lost his beloved wife, and together with the body, her dress and ornaments had been burned on the pyre. On the seventh day, as the widower was reading Plato's Phaedo to escape his grief for a while, she entered and sat by him, complaining that one of her golden sandals had not been burned. It had, in fact, 
fallen behind the chest and escaped the flames. As she spoke, the Miletian dog barked, and she vanished. The sandal, being found later, was burned, and the dead woman never returned again. Graveyards always aroused in the Greeks an uncanny feeling. Some remnant of life might still inhabit the body. Thus, who could be sure that the deceased might not leave the grave, or at least send forth a specter? In the funeral avenues and the necropolis, there also appeared superhuman phantoms of the night, such as the infernal Hecate, whose repulsive figure was accompanied by souls and howling dogs swarming over the graves. A similar specter showed itself to Dion, a pupil of Plato and ruler of Syracuse. Having finally rid himself of the villainous Heraclides, Dion was resting in the vestibule of his house and absorbed in his thoughts when something stirred behind him. He turned and beheld a powerful woman whose face and black garments were called a goddess of vengeance. She was, sleeping with the ha she was sweeping the hall with the besom. As he cried out for help, the apparition faded. A few days later, Dion's son committed suicide, after the ruler himself was assassinated shortly afterwards. On his journey to India, Apollonius of Tyana had crossed the snow-capped Caucasus and wandered now by moonlight with his companion Damis through the plain. They reached the Indus River, where they met Empusa, a hobgoblin that was continually changing form, and sometimes vanishing into limbo. And Apollonius, realizing what it was, abused the hobgoblin and instructed the members of his party to do the same, explaining that this was the remedy for such a visitation. The phantasm fled, shrieking even as ghosts do. Later, after his return from India, Apollonius journeyed through Greece, stopping at Athens, Ephesus, and Corinth. According to Apollonius's biographer, Philostratus, the philosopher while in Corinth met Alemia, a vampire. One of Apollonius's followers was Menippus, a poor young student whose sole possession was the philosopher's cloak. Apollonius had been attracted by the youth's beauty and good judgment. It was rumored by his friends that Menippus was loved by a foreign lady, a Phoenician, who was beautiful and extremely rich. She wanted to marry Menippus despite the contrasting social rank. Menippus was happy to make her his wife, for he loved her devotedly. He invited Apollonius to be the guest of honor at the wedding breakfast, and the master, sensing danger for his disciple, declared that for the special occasion he would break his habit of abstaining from rich meals and wine. When he arrived at the lady's house, he asked to be introduced to the bride. He looked at her searchingly and, turning to Menippus, he asked to whom the silver and gold vessels and decorations of the banqueting hall belonged. To the lady, replied the youth, for this is all I possess, and he touched the mantle that he wore. All this adornment, Apollonius said, is not reality but semblance, and thy fine and dainty bride is not a mortal but a vampire, a lamia. These beings are devoted to the delights of Aphrodite, but still more to devouring human flesh. The lady pretended to be disgusted with such nonsense. Obviously amused, she said that philosophers were always spoiling the pleasures of honest people, frightening them with evil omens, and she commanded her unwelcome guest to leave. But Apollonius took one of the silver goblets from the table and weighed it in his hand. It was light as a feather, and soon it vanished. In a similar way, the other plate disappeared. The cooks and servants fell to dust when Apollonius uttered a magical imprecation. The house tumbled into ruins. The lady, imploring that she had intended to fatten Menippus before devouring him, for it was her habit to feed upon young and beautiful bodies because their blood is pure and strong. The fear of specters and other apparitions did not prevent the conjuring up of the dead at special places that were chosen for these rites, such as Mantia, Psychomantia, and Psychopompeia. The conjurers of the deceased were called psychagogues. Little is known of their ritual, 
but we may take it for granted that they demanded fasting and concentration. Blood and burned offerings were surely necessary for the ceremonies and the silence of night. The psychagogues must have had considerable influence. Among them there was one who did not fear to announce the bad tidings to the tyrant Periander, when his wife spoke from the underworld. She was cold and naked, for at her funeral her clothes had been interred with her and not burned according to custom. Whereupon the wise Periander ordered a public feast for all Corinthian women. Arrayed in their best garments, they gathered in a public square, expecting a brilliant show or some other treat. However, they were ordered to undress, and their fine raiments were gathered and burned in a pit for the benefit of the deceased. Periander's wife announced through the mouth of the psychogogue that she was warm now and comfortable in the kingdom of Hades. Although some of the philosophers, notably Plato, protested vigorously against necromancy, its practice remained an integral part of the Hellenic religion. Together with the cult of the dead and the conjuring up of the deceased, magical rites were used to propitiate dead heroes. These demigods were feared, yet they were considered benevolent patrons during danger. The heroes were, as a rule, connected with a city or a district. In earlier times they may have been the family ancestors or the house god, worshipped with the fire of the hearth. Their tombs were small buildings, surrounded by colonnades, venerable trees, and orderly gardens. Others were invisible, hidden beneath some public building, and the location of their shrines was kept secret because it was feared that the hero's bones might be stolen. Like the relics of Christian saints, these bones were endowed with beneficent power that brought luck to the city or to the province where they were buried. This belief may be illustrated by the weird myth of Oedipus, the murderer of his father and spouse of his mother who, in expiation for his monstrous deeds, wanders distractedly through Hellenic lands. Though abhorred by all, and despite his atrocious crime, the hero is offered an asylum by rival cities, because it is generally known that wherever Oedipus is buried, he will bring luck to that land and its inhabitants. Hero magic was accomplished at night, and solemnity accompanied it. Its ritual was different from that used for the worship of the gods. A groove was opened at the west side of the tomb, and magical formulas were recited. The sacrificial offering consisted of wine, milk, and pomades. Blood was poured into a crack of the tomb, and it was believed to revive the dead. An active force emanated from the shrine, guiding the destinies of the living, influencing the welfare of the city, and exerting its mysterious power within the landmarks of the country. In Aeschylus's <clears throat> Cheophores, the entombed Agamemnon, though never visible, is a coactive power, and without him the play could not be concluded. In the Persians, the hero king Darius rises from his tomb and takes part in the action. In this play, Aeschylus creates the imposing image of the magical rites, the evocation of the dead. It is but a short step from the sublime to the ridiculous. The Greeks created heroes from bizarre, allegorical beings, who became the clowns of the cult. In Munichia, they offered these honors to the mythical Akratopotes, who drank undiluted wine. No doubt he was a drunkard, for the Greeks used to add water to their wine. Carrion and Maton, the wine mixer and the baker, were Spartan heroes, and in Boeotia, bread and cake were worshipped as heroes. This self-irony is typically Greek. In the Near East, the cults were clad in pathos. We searched the Old Testament in vain for a conscious, humorous note. The rites of the Phrygians, the Babylonians, and the Assyrians are awesome. Those practiced by the Persians and the Hebrews are severe and sober.